Hi again, it's Lori Nickel with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. I had two real quick, if that's okay. Um, the first is what kind of a fresh start can a head coach get like this? And is this fresh start unique because you are coming back home, you know the ropes, you know the territory? Yes, I think Lori, anytime you start at a, at a program that has such a history uh, like Marquette does, the first thing when you, when you have that start is to make sure you understand the history of the program. You know, for me, this is my third head coaching job. Um, and, you know, I've, I've learned a lot, you know, going from VCU, it was important for me. I'm a history guy. So to understand the people that made the program, uh, what it was the same at Texas, uh, as I mentioned in the press conference, had some unbelievable moments uh, over the time, six years at Texas, some, some great relationships. Um, but we, Maya and I really felt like this was a, a terrific time and a terrific place uh, for us to be. So we're so excited about being here at Marquette. The other thing I wanted to ask, um, it sounds like you're excited to be at Marquette, but was it ever a goal of yours to get back home other than the other <laughs> Marquette offer or whatever? Have you ever considered or pursued any other jobs in the state of Wisconsin, whether head coach or assistant, beginner, anything like that? No, uh, I'll be honest with you. As I said in the press conference, I'm really, really happy to be close to home, uh, close to my mom, close to uh, a brother who lives in Chicago. Uh, but more than anything, we're happy to be at Marquette. And, uh, you know, obviously Marquette is a huge part of this community. Um, and we're excited about, you know, just being part of the family. Thank you. Uh, Bob, if you want to state your media affiliation and go ahead. Hey, Shaka, Bob Ballou, CBS Austin. What's uh, up, Bob? You. How you doing? <laughs> How's it going, man? Good. Congratulations. Um, you mentioned the basketball centric school that you're at now. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, times here in Austin, it's tough uh, to, to get all that kind of excitement around the basketball program. How difficult was that on you? Uh, at, in your time at Texas, because obviously that's something that, you know, you, you just experience here. Well, I'll tell you what, I was at VCU for six years. We we're fortunate. We had a sellout streak going of over a hundred games when I left. And I always told myself, don't ever take for granted the fact that the arena is filled uh, on, on every night. And, you know, in, in moving from VCU to Texas, I knew that, first of all, the arena was over twice as big. Um, but I also knew that, you know, that the number one passion, um, you know, was and, and will always be football. But, you know, as someone who worked at, at University of Florida as an assistant, um, I knew that you certainly can be very, very successful in multiple sports. And so it's not like it's mutually exclusive. Um, it, it, it is a good feeling to be... Uh, at Marquette, that is, you know, you, just knowing that it's a basketball centric place, um, you know, that's not taken away from anywhere else. And then second, just can you talk about the range of emotions in a week going from what you went through Saturday night two weeks ago to, to what you're going through now, the smile on your face at Marquette? Yeah, I mean, and it's more than that, Bob. It's, uh, you know, all the communication with different people over the course of that time. Uh, you know, anytime the season ends, it's an extremely abrupt ending, but I think in this COVID era, that's multiplied by five because the emotional investment, uh, the, the physical investment that the guys on, on our team made, that the guys on our staff made, uh, you know, that's, that stuff is, is significant. And then <clears throat> when you're in the NCAA tournament, the way it works is one team wins and, and continues and, and, and one team loses and has to go home almost immediately. So that was tough um, from the standpoint of just the care and concern that, that the guys on that team and the coaching staff on that team had for each other. Um, but that's the way it works. And, 
you know, this kind of moved quickly uh, with the, the opportunity to come to Marquette. And, you know, honestly, uh, Maya and I, you know, felt like it was, it was just a great opportunity for us. Thanks, Shaka. Really wish you the best. Thank you, Bob, and wish you and Finley the best. Lane, go ahead. Hey, Coach. Lane Casanante, WTVR in Richmond. I'm going even further back than Bob did. All the way What's back up, Lane? To, to 2011. How are you? Congratulations. Um, it's been 10 years uh, since you put VCU on the March Madness map. Um, when you go back and think about that run 10 years ago, what are the first things that come to your mind? Oh, so many great memories from that time. Honestly, the first things that come to mind are, are things that happened more outside of the games um, during that time. Uh, but just team moments where, you know, guys did different things together that were so much fun. You know, that team, as you know, you know, was an underdog throughout the tournament. And coming from VCU, you know, the VCU program at that time was you know not quite as established as it is now, not quite as um, you know well funded as it is now. It was really well funded. I'm not taking the but things have have really evolved since then. Um, and so I'll tell you a quick story. Our guys thought it was really cool that when you went to the NCAA tournament, every locker room you went into when it was an open practice the the day before, there was a huge refrigerator filled with drinks, all different types of drinks. And they kind of, you know, we played in four different sites of so Dayton, Chicago, San Antonio, and Houston. They kind of got into this habit of after the practice, we'd go back in there, the guys would get ready to go. And then they would just clean out the fridge. I mean, they would take everything. And, uh, you know, it's something that you smile and look back at uh, because they were so, appreciative of just, you know, extra drinks, you know, um, but it's stuff like that, that you remember. You have name recognition now, obviously, and a track record of success. You didn't have that when you came here, but you got guys to buy in. How did your, how did your experience getting those guys to buy in? How has it helped you each step of the way and how might it even help you today? Well, I think the way to get people to buy into your, your vision is through relationships and also through getting them to understand that it's good for them. You know, it's, it's, it's a partnership uh, that has not changed. Uh, you know, certainly sometimes guys want to know what you've done before or where you've been or who you've coached. And, you know, I guess as you get older, as a coach, you have a little bit more of that, but it comes down to relationships and the feeling that, people are able to elicit in each other. The best teams have that. They make people, they make teammates, they make coaches, they make players on the team feel a certain way, feel a certain energy. And with that, you know, you can run through a wall. I don't know if you know this, but Franklin Street Gym no longer stands. They knocked it down. They're putting up another building. But you, almost took, you almost took care of it 10 years before that with the burning the schedule in the, in the trash bucket thing. And it caught a little more fire than you were expecting. When you did that, did you, I know you were hoping it would have the effect that it did, but was it kind of a, a reach for you at the time? No, I mean, it was just a, it was a prop, you know, sometimes coaches use different props and the thing with those sorts of things lane is if you win and you're successful and you go on a run, then those stories are great. And if you lose or you don't go on a run, then they're not, you know, and it just so happened that we won a bunch of games in the month of March. So burning the calendar in the month of February was pretty cool, but that's not why we won. It was Jamie Skeen and Bradford Burgess and Joey Rodriguez, Ed Nixon, Brandon Rozell, Darius Theus, Troy Daniels, uh, that group of guys, they're, you know, just buying into something larger than themselves. Thank you, coach. Congratulations. Good luck up at MU. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Roger Wallace. Hey, Shaka. Um, I, I, I talked to Joe Schwartz, a great example of a kid that was affected. And 
and the, the wins and losses I know are important, but the impact you have on, on players and their lives, what did those six years mean to you here in Austin? Oh, unbelievable relationships with those guys and lifelong relationships. Um, that's, that's the hardest part is the same thing at VCU. It's the hardest part of leaving is, is leaving relationships. Um, but the good thing is, you know, just being able to stay in close contact and, and stay in communication with guys. But, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to, I got a lot of pictures that I, I, I that I keep that, um, you know, different folks over the years, you know, whether it's Shal or different members of our program sent to me pictures of, uh, you know, me with the guys or just players out there on the floor doing different things. And I, I just, I really enjoy just sometimes just scrolling through my phone and uh, it gives you a feeling of, man, it was pretty cool to be a part of this. You know, it was, it was, and, and, and not because necessarily of, like you said, wins and losses or even, even what it says on the front of your jersey, but pretty cool to be, you know, associated with the guys that, that, that I got a chance to be associated with. And, uh, and I'm forever grateful for that. I got to jump off. You can respect this. Eddie Reese just retired. So I'm, I'm jumping on that Zoom. <laughs> oh, wow. Good time, yeah. for, good time for him to retire. Great to see you, Thanks, Jocka. Uh, next, we'll go to Zoe Comerford. Hi, Coach. I know you touched about it a little bit in the uh, intro presser, but I just kind of want to know uh, what you're most excited about off the court, like showing your daughter around town, obviously being a native of Wisconsin. Well, Zoe, first of all, I need to tell you this. Uh, we did hire a female strength coach at Texas a couple years ago. So I should have mentioned that during the press conference when you asked. Um, secondly, looking forward to Zora, a lot of things. Um, just showing her Milwaukee, uh, showing her you know, the rest of the state of Wisconsin, you know, when time allows, um, you know, driving over to Madison and, and getting a chance to spend time with, with their grandmother. Um, you know, I, I know for a fact that, that Zora is really going to, going to love it up here. I'm looking forward to taking her to some Marquette women's soccer games. That's going to be fun. Um, but you know, she's, she's excited about being up here. Uh, just a couple more for coach. Um, we'll go to Jaden Daly. Hey, Shaka, Jaden Daly, Daily Dose of Hoops. Great to hear from you again. Now, you mentioned in the press conference, and you've always prided yourself on having a culture where the 10th and 11th men on your roster are just as important as your top two or three. And I remember when you won the A-10, you were talking about Doug Brooks and Jaquan Lewis and praising them and how important they were after Briante went down with his knee injury. What's the biggest component in finding a harmony on your roster where your productivity doesn't matter as much as your positive energy and your impact beyond the final score? You know, Jaden, that's a great question. And it has become tougher and tougher. You know, I, I would say, you know, 25 years ago, when I was a teenager, um, it was more, hey, everybody do what the coach says. And, you know, some guys might not like it, but, you know, if, if the coach says this, you went and did it. You know, it's a different, it's a different world we live in now. I think social media, uh, I think the media, I think the 24-hour news cycle, um, con you know, continuous coverage has changed things. So it's incredibly important for guys to know and feel like they're valued members of the team. Now you only have 200 minutes to dole out in a regulation game. One of the exercises we do often with our teams is letting the guys go up on the whiteboard and write out how many minutes they would play each guy on the team, but it can only add up to 200. And it's interesting because when you talk about games, like you mentioned, a 10 championship game, anytime you're able to do something special, inevitably there's a guy that maybe doesn't have eye popping numbers, maybe doesn't start or play even significant minutes, most games, 
but there's a guy that helps you win. And that's the unique dynamic we have in basketball. It is a consummate team game, but in so many ways it is evaluated and even marketed at times, especially at the highest level by the individual. And so our job as coaches is to deal with that kind of interplay between team sport and individual evaluation. Uh, because let's face it, you know, players that are good enough to play at this level, they do have goals, individual goals, even beyond college. And, and that's a good thing. All right, our last question today will be from John Dodds. John, go ahead. John, uh, you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Uh, Coach, welcome to Marquette. John Dodds from MarquetteHoops.com, 24-7 Sports. This is a unique opportunity this year with the NCAA transfer portal. Yeah, it's, people have called it the Wild West in terms of player movement. What is the proper protocol? Does somebody contact you from AAU um, or from a, a parent or something that someone who you have a relationship with, maybe you missed out on the recruit two or three years ago, then mm -hmm. what happens? And uh, I assume there's a protocol you would like if someone is interested in one of your players too. Well, occasionally they contact us, but more often it would be, you know, us contacting them. The NCAA changed how transferring works a couple of years ago and they created what's called a transfer portal, uh, which is now much maligned by some coaches because it's, uh, it just has made things interesting. But basically if a student athlete desires to transfer from school A, um, he or she needs to go into the transfer portal. It's a basic uh, form that you fill out to go into the transfer portal. Once someone's in the portal, then the other schools have permission, school B, C, and D have permission to contact uh, that student athlete. And so right now, I don't know the exact number, but uh, it's, you know, maybe a thousand guys, you know, in, in division one basketball in the transfer portal. And those numbers are growing every day. So um, that's how it works. And if you're a school that's interested in, in that young man, like you said, maybe it's someone that you recruited previously, someone you played against or coached against uh, or someone just that you, you know, is a really good player. Then, you know, once they're in the transfer portal, you, you pick up the phone and call. Thanks.